And aren't we thankful for the mercy of God? Amen. I know I am. Mark chapter 1, we're going to be looking at verses 29 through 39 this morning. So if you want to take your copy of God's Word, open it to there or push the button and scroll. Just get yourself to the Gospel of Mark today. As you are getting there, I'll tell you that last winter, a 10-year-old Russian girl went missing and survived a heavy Siberian snowstorm by hugging a dog. The unnamed girl left her school in the town of Aglexkirk, say that three times fast, and failed to return home. This town often experiences extremely heavy snow and winds that exceed 50 miles an hour. Authorities and residents searched overnight for the girl after it was determined, one, that she was missing. And they chose to focus on houses with pets because locals reported seeing the girl playing with a dog the day of her disappearance. A volunteer found the girl in good health the next morning, sitting with a dog in the outdoor kennel with her arms wrapped around it to keep warm. While it appears that this story is about a girl, one who maybe got preoccupied or maybe one who got lost, it's really the story of a dog. You know, a dog just being a dog, doing what dogs do, right? By nature, dogs like people. By instinct, dogs help people. And as a result, a girl made it through the night and a town celebrated a reunion rather than mourning a loss. Maybe we could learn something from a dog, or maybe yet we could learn to be better than man's best friend, the dog. So this morning, Mark is going to show us how we, collectively, you and I, can meet needs and help other people like Jesus. Our willingness might just change someone's life, might just change the community that we live in as well. Let's pray and ask God to bless our time this morning. There, Jesus, I do thank you that your mercy is more. God, I, I thank you that you give us so much that we don't deserve. Sometimes, God, we, we tend to, to discount you. We think that all you're interested in is rules to be followed, or we have a very narrow, defined view of who you are, but you are a God who loves, who is merciful, who is gracious, uh, who comes to us in our deepest needs and in the worst places of our lives, and you just simply say, follow me no other expectation, because you know that as we spend time with you, we'll become more like you. And so, God, I pray that today that we will choose to be more like you, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. So, Mark, we've been talking about this gospel written by Mark. We're going to be picking up in verse 29 this morning, if you want to follow along with me, and this is what he tells us. And immediately, after they came out of the synagogue, if you remember, he had been in the synagogue, he'd been teaching, he had cast out a demon, he had done some amazing things, that they came to the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now, we know Simon to be Peter, and so we are at Peter's house. Verse 30 tells us that Simon's mother-in-law was laying sick with a fever, and immediately they spoke to Jesus about her. And he came to her, and he raised her up, taking her by the hand, and the fever left her, and she waited on them. And when evening came, after the sun had set, they began bringing to him all who were ill and those who were demon-possessed. And the whole city had gathered at the door. That's a party. And he healed many who were ill with various diseases, and he cast out many demons, it says, and he was not permitting the demons to speak because they knew who he was. In the early morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up and, and left the house, and he went away to a secluded place, and he was praying there. And they found him and said to him, Everybody is looking for you. And he said to them, let us go somewhere else to the towns that are nearby so that I may preach also there. 
for that is why I came. And he went into their synagogues throughout all of Galilee, preaching and casting out the demons. So, a bigger portion of Scripture than what we've been reading over the last several weeks, but but here's really what's going on. Historically, this is what Mark wants us to see about what we've just read. He wants us to see Jesus helping people, okay? Jesus helping people. These 10 verses or so, they tell us that that, they, they, they see that demonstrated. Mark tells us that Jesus left the synagogue and he went to the people. So he went from the gathering where they were talking about the things of God. He left there and he went to the people, the people who obviously were in need of what he had. Jesus helped Peter's mother-in-law, and he personally interacted with her. He treated her with respect, with dignity, as the individual human being that she is. And so he, he went to her and personally interacted. Jesus helped those who lived in Capernaum, okay? That was the town where they were gathered. He made time for them even late into the evening, okay? So, I mean, he gave up his, you know, his Sabbath popcorn and his nachos and his ice cream or whatever it is that they ate, you know, after they'd been to church, so to speak. And he spent time with them late into the evening doing things for them. And so he showed them value because these people gathered, they had great need, right? And so he didn't send them away. He didn't say it was too late. He didn't say, can't you see that I'm here in my sweatpants and I'm just waiting to go to sleep? He didn't do any of those things. He actually made time for them. Jesus desired to help others that were in the nearby towns as well, and he went to them to share his preaching and healing ministry. So he didn't just stay in one place. He didn't just say, okay, everybody come to me because that's easy. He went out to the other people. So that's what Mark historically wants us to see. So what's theologically going on here? What is it that's being said about God? What is it that we can see about Jesus himself and what's going on? And so Mark wants us to see the work of Jesus, okay? And so in one hand, we see that he's helping people, but he wants us to see the work of Jesus. This is what Jesus was specifically doing because, see, that's where we got to start working with folks. All of us come to God with some sort of misconception, who we think he is, how he, we think he's going to interact with us. I mean, let's be honest. Haven't we had a hard time telling a spouse or a family member, a friend, what's really going on in our lives because we're afraid how they might take it or how they might look at us or how they might judge us? Okay, same thing. Sometimes we have those feelings about God. We think, I can't walk in those doors because the steeple's going to fall off. The roof's going to cave in. It's going to catch fire. I'm going to drop dead. I'm going to get struck by a lightning bolt. I mean, we have heard all the things, but God's not that way. God says, hey, if you can set aside your misconceptions for just a moment, I'm going to show you something amazing. I'm going to reveal to you that I'm not who you think I am that I'm someone so much better. Because, hey, those of us who have opened up in the past, when you finally do that, when you haven't been rejected, when you've received love, you kind of go, ah, right? Something amazing happens. That's what we're going to see here with Jesus. Jesus has compassion, okay? Now, you might think compassion is a bad thing, It's not. Let's look at this. Immediately, Jesus came to Peter's house where his mother-in-law was laying sick. He literally accompanied them to the place of their need, right? Jesus said, I'm going to come to with you to where the need is at. And so he came to that house. He came to her. Jesus responded by raising her up. Now, that is an actual physical act, right? It changed her physical position. She was laying down, now she is up, but it also changed her present situation, right? Changing her inwardly and outwardly, as in rescuing her from death and awakening her to life. I mean, we are really kind of blessed and really kind of spoiled, right? 
I mean, you think about what antibiotics do for us. You think about what fever reducers do for us, right? And we don't have to go back very far into our collective history that a high fever would kill you, right? I mean, that's just the way it used to be. And so here is Peter's mother-in-law, and she may or may not be on the edge of death. I mean, the word here used for fever literally means to be like on fire. I mean, so she was super hot to the touch. And yet Jesus raised her up as if saying, hey, you once were dead, but now you're alive. Things are going to be okay. And not just there, but Jesus took her by the hand and he helped her. He literally became her strength and continue to do that, all right? I, you know, we've all been sick at one time or another, right? We've all had the spaghetti legs, right? Because all we've had in her, if we're lucky, is some 7-Up and maybe some crackers, you know? And it's like, oh, I mean, doing the easy things even isn't easy anymore. But what did Jesus do? He raised her up. He took her by the hand. He literally became her strength. That tells us that no matter where we're at in life and no matter how strong we think we are, God is there to provide what? The strength that you and I desperately need. His compassion was not just limited to her physical sickness. It extended to the need that she had because her life was broken by sin. Now, a lot of times we don't like to talk about that. We like to talk about Jesus the healer, and he does amazing things, and he fixes what's broken. And man, I wish he'd fix this spot right here on my back, right, where I wouldn't ever have to worry about it again. Okay, but there's something bigger going on. Life is broken by sin. We play around with sin. We discount sin. We don't like to use the word sin, but sin is ugly and it breaks everything. I mean, why is the world the way it is? Well, it's because of sin. Why do we not get the rain? Why do we experience tornadoes? Why, why do we have the, where the crops don't do what they should do, even though we did the exact same to them this year that we did last year, but what's going on? It's sin. Sin broke the planet. I mean, it, just in the same way that it broke us, right? I mean, if you go back and read in Genesis, you see that the ground that used to produce everything naturally now is going to produce thorns and thistles and do things. That's why when Jesus promises what's coming in the future, he doesn't just promise us a new birth, right, to renew us, but he promises us a new heaven and a new earth that he's going to redeem everything everything that sin broke, all right? So this woman didn't just have a physical ailment. She had a sin problem that was in her, and he dealt with that. Jesus came to her, and she willingly agreed to his overture, that idea of drawing near. He drew near to her. She allowed that to happen, okay? When he raised her, it was to new life, like literally being born again. That word raised here in the original language is using that type of word picture, one of being born. All right? And so it, we're, we're seeing that not only did he physically heal her, right? But he healed her on the inside where her soul and where her sin problem had been. And that he took her by the hand and his grasp, right? was one that would hold fast forever. Because how powerful is God? Yeah, he's what you're thinking, and he's beyond that. So when Jesus says, no one will ever be able to snatch you out of my hand, right? That's the type of power we're talking about. That's the forever power of salvation, right? We can't earn salvation, and therefore we can't say we don't want salvation once we've experienced salvation, right? Because God is that powerful. And so he took her by the hand. He became her forever strength for the rest of her life here and her life all beyond. That's what he did. That's the compassion that he's showing. He faithfully led her as his authority, because that word strong here means one to control, one of being a master. And so he's saying, I'm going to be your master. I'm going to lead you. I am going to provide the strength you need for your life forever. And so that's what we're seeing going on here. So these words let us see that Jesus' compassion towards her sickness demonstrates 
the compassion he also had for her soul, which is the same reason why we'll see when Jesus healed the man who was paralyzed and he was going to tell him to get up off his mat and walk. He said, I'm going to heal him this way to show you that I have the authority to forgive his sins because that's where he started, right? I've, your sins are forgiven. Everybody went, oh, you can't do that, Jesus. And he said, to show you that I can, arise, stand up and walk. And he did. And so Jesus has compassion. Real compassion is helping the whole person. So real compassion for me and you is that, yes, we want to help people where their physical needs are, right? But real compassion is also being concerned about their soul. Do they know Jesus? Do they need Jesus? To help one without the other is not being compassionate. If I say, oh, I'm only going to tell you about Jesus, but I'm not going to lift you out of where you're at, that's not compassion. It's not compassion to say either that I'm just going to help you in your need, and I'm not going to tell you about the one that can change your forever need. You have to have both, and that's what we see here in Jesus. Jesus demonstrates not just compassion, but inclusivity. Oh, that's a fun word we like in our culture today, right? We hear about it a lot. So as Jesus came, he began, as the evening came along, Jesus began interacting. I want you to notice these words from what we read. He interacted with all who were ill, with those who were possessed, with the whole of the city that had gathered. And in doing so, he healed many and he cast out the demons of many. Now, those are some pretty big words, are they not? Many, whole, all, those. I mean, that's, that's, that's a lot of there. These words reveal Jesus' desire to know each and every person, all. Not broadly, but specifically, right? Those. So he wanted to know all, but he wanted to know specifically those. And he wanted to know them regardless of their circumstance. The many who needed this, the many who needed that. Now I want to ask you, are you a part of that all? Is he concerned about you, those specifically? Is he interested in you regardless of the many things that you have done, are doing, or maybe think? Yes, he is. That's inclusivity. In fact, our world often uses this word inclusive, inclusivity, to mean to agree with somebody wholeheartedly in thought regardless of behavior, right? Right? So to include somebody means I have to accept you no matter what you're doing and no matter what you're thinking, and I have to accept all of that, and I have to not just accept it, I have to agree with it. Now, whew, that's a tall order. That's the way the world chooses to define that word. But how does the Bible, according to this passage, define inclusivity? I'm glad you asked, because that's what we're going to look at. The Bible defines it, the fact with God came to anyone despite their thoughts and behaviors. So the world is only interested in what you do, while Jesus is interested in who you are. All right. So the world says, you have to accept me in my behavior and you have to agree with everything. And the Bible's saying, no, I have to include you as a group and love you like Jesus as a group, despite what's going on. I love you as the person, but I don't have to agree with what you are doing in action. It's about the everyone and not the defined behavior. And so that's what Jesus is showing us. Real inclusivity is more concerned about the person rather than the performance. Let's finish this part out then. So if Jesus is interested in exclusivity and in compassion, 
But let's look at this. What does he also do? He prioritizes the truth. All right? So it's not that, okay, I'm going to love you, and I'm going to love all of you, but now we're going to deal with the truth that makes it happen. All right? He prioritizes this. Jesus leaves early in the morning. So, you know, it must have been right after daylight savings time, right? I mean, that must be what's going on here. Because it's a lot darker now early in the morning than what I'd like it to be. Jesus leaves early in the morning to seek the truth from God in prayer. Prayer's not just a one-way thing, right? I mean, it's a time where we get alone and we get to talk and we get to listen. So Jesus goes and does this. And upon finding out that everyone is looking for him, all right? So your translations might say seeking, might say looking. If you've got an even older one, it'll throw in the word hunting, all right? Because this word in the original language really means to stalk, to, to go after, okay? And, and so the town is hunting after Jesus. Well, because they want Jesus to do more of that miraculous stuff, right? And I, I, I get that. I mean, I don't blame them, but they are wanting the miraculous. Jesus, upon discerning this, is realizing that they're really more interested in the miracles than the message, And so he realizes that we're going to do something different because he prioritizes the truth. And so that's why he makes a decision. We're going to go to others, and I'm going to preach them the good news. And I love this. I mean, in your Bible, it's just kind of after a a comma, because that's why I came. Why did Jesus come? To proclaim the good news to talk about the kingdom of God. The miracles and the helping demonstrated the validity behind the message. They were important, but the real reason was what? The truth of God. Because that's what causes me to want to help people. Let's be honest. There are some people who are tenderhearted and compassionate by nature. And then there are those of us, myself included, who've had to learn to be tenderhearted and compassionate towards others because that's what Jesus has taught us and shown us that that's what love really is. It's one thing to love your spouse. It's another thing to love your children. It's another thing completely to love this stranger out here who just is, doesn't care about me and they're only interested in hurting themselves, right? My only reason I love that is because Jesus loves me, and now my definition of love and my motive and my desire has been changed by him to where I I love them too, right? And so I wouldn't know how to love if I didn't know that he was love. And so that's where the truth of God comes in. That's why the truth of God is so important. And so Jesus informs his followers it's time to leave so that he can preach the truth to others. He demonstrates that the focus of his work is preaching that good news. He came because of their compa- he was compassionate. He invites all people to have their needs met because that's what it means to be inclusive. But ultimately, it's sharing the truth of God with conviction for the point of persuasion that brings victory. I share with you the truth of God, not just so that you can know more stuff. I share with you the truth of God because I want God's Holy Spirit to persuade you to be like Jesus. Not me persuading you. I want God to do it. You you do it because of me. You might do it because I'm your friend. You might do it because I don't want to disappoint. But when it comes right down to it, when God persuades us and he changes us, that's a forever change, right? Right? to the very core. And so I share with you the good news of Jesus so that you will be persuaded by God himself to allow him to change your life forever. That's the priority, right? Because I say changed lives change lives you don't like our country, you don't like what's going on, you don't like the way our society is, we well, you know how we change that? We pray and ask God to change that. So how does God do that? Well, God sometimes does miraculous things, but you know what the biggest miracle is? A changed life. And so God changes one life, and he changes another life, and he changes another life, and then over time we see what? God has done amazing things in people's lives. That's what it's all about. So let's look at the practical thing real this morning as we wrap everything up. 
Mark wants us to employ the ways of Jesus. Mark wants us to do what we've heard about, okay? It's time to do it. I mean, he wants us to see the ministry. He wants us to see the work. But ultimately, it's now it's time to do it. I've shown you how to use the post hole digger. Now it's time for you to use the post hole digger, right? I have taught you at one point to hold the flashlight for me so that I could work on the car. Now it's time for you to work on the car, right? Time for us to do things. Even I can be taught. It's time for you to watch somebody cook and make a recipe. It's time for me to follow said recipe and see if it actually turns out the way it's supposed to. My wife's back to go, he still doesn't do it. I'm not bad. I'm not bad. I can learn too, just like everybody else. So what's the first thing that we need to see this morning? We must advocate for those in need. All right? This is how we can be compassionate like Jesus. Jesus came to people. He offered people something different, and then he helped them live a new life, right? Isn't that what this passage showed us? So we, how can we do that? Well, we need to pray personally for people. Do you have at least one person? I mean, let's just start here. Do you have one person that you can pray for that they need something? That's where we start. Do you petition God as a group for people? How about your Sunday school class? How about your friend group? How about your family? Have you come together and said, you know what? I'm concerned about this person or this situation. Let's come together and ask God to do something amazing. Does he not tell us in Scripture that we're two or more gathered in his name and that he is there too? So we can be upset that life is this way. We can be upset that life is hurting people and we don't like it. Or we can do something, you know? We're inclined, you know, to protest, right? I mean, because we think about us as a country. We're, we are defined by protest, right? We told the king of England, we don't like your stuff anymore. We're going to do it our way. I mean, our whole nation's kind of birthed on that. But, you know, instead of doing this, how about we do a little bit of this, right? How about we pray together and let God Almighty do something for us? So can you pray for one? Can you come together and pray? Can you go to people, proceed to people in their daily life? So it's not just, okay, can I do this from my prayer closet? Or can I do this here at the church? But can I go into the community to friends, meet new people, and say, you know, in the midst of where your life is right now, let's do something. That's how we advocate for others. That's what God calls us to do. That's what God's calling you to do today. We must do for one what we wish we could do for everyone. I know because sometimes you'll hear a pastor, me, say this, and you're thinking, I'm so overwhelmed. Where do I start? The problems in life seem so... (sighs) Do for one what you wish you could do for everybody else. Let me explain that just a smidge. This is how we can be inclusive like Jesus We can do this by befriending people. Isn't that what Jesus did with Peter's mother-in-law? He befriended her. We can interact with people like Jesus did. I mean, think about all that city that came out to Jesus, right? Can we interact with people? Now, I know some of you are going, some of you are going, yeah, people person, love that. Others are going, I'm an introvert, and I am shy. I don't think I could do that. It'll make me cry, right? I mean, it's just really bad. Okay, but you know what? You can still be introverted and still interact with people, right? You just do that on your terms, maybe in a really small group, maybe in a way that's kind of distant, you know? But you can interact with people. You can do stuff. I mean, Jesus did it, all right? We also need to pursue people. Jesus' disciples pursued Jesus and found people. You know, sometimes people see who we are and they think, they're going to tell me Jesus stuff, and I'm not going to do that. So, you know, we've got the little cloud of dust going, the feet kind of keep moving just like in the cartoon, and we're gone. But we pursue anyway, right? Because we love. Do we have that in us to pursue? I mean, sometimes God does something, boom, quick, it's amazing. Maybe today, maybe today is your day of salvation. Maybe today you realize, oh, I need to be doing this. I'm going to do it. Awesome. Sometimes, you know, it takes a while. Are you willing to hang in there? 
That's what we need to do. One last thing for you. We must share the truth with everyone. That's how we prioritize it. What is it that comes out of your mouth? What is it that you're known for? All right? You can be the sports guy. You can be the weather guy. You can be the cow farm guy. You can be the work guy. You can be all those people. But are you also a Jesus person? Are you known for talking about the coolness of Jesus? Now, no, you don't got to be preachy. You don't got to quote all the verses. But are you known as somebody who likes to talk about how Jesus can take care of stuff? And no, you don't have to be the preacher person to do that. And no, you don't pay the preacher person to do that, right? We are all to be people who do that because we're all ministers of God. So here are three things that you need to say. You can write them down. You can remember them if you're better than me. But here we go. You need to say to other people that you are important to God because they don't believe it. But you are important to God. How do I know this? Well, because... Jesus said, the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. He came to seek and save. That's how important you are. You know, we also know this, that God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. While you were a hot mess and I was a hot mess, God came for us anyway. He didn't say, clean yourself up and we'll talk. He said, I'm coming right now and yeah, I see what mess your life's in. Let's do something about that. So the first thing we tell people, what? You're important to God. Second thing, you can be saved by God. Do you believe that God can save people? Man, I hope you do because many of you have said he did it to me. All right, this is what Jesus said. I mean, you can probably quote this with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, right? That whoever believes in him will not perish, but will have eternal life. I mean, that's God's promise to save. And then he tells us how we can do that. If you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, you can be saved. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. You want to be saved this morning? You know all you have to do? God save me. But you might think, but I don't know all the rules. I don't know how to do that. That's why Jesus just said, follow me. I'll teach you. I'll show you. Do you think these disciples, after just being called by Jesus, knew what to do? Do you think they had all the answers? They just knew I'm going to follow him, and when I couldn't find him, I'm going to go search for him. I don't always even have all the answers. Sometimes some of you come and ask me questions, and i got to go, whoa, don't got that one. Let me, let me go do some searching, and let me come back to you. That's totally okay. Here's the last one that you need. You're important to God. You can be saved by God. You can live for God. You know, Ms. Kendra showed us an awesome illustration about how God completely changes our lives, right? You know, and some of us in our small group, we talked about a lady who'd been messed up in life and how Jesus said, go and sin no more. I want to let you know that you can live for God because Jesus just said, follow me. You've heard me say that over and over again, right? But listen to this truth. The Bible says there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation means, basically, God's saying, if you are in me, I'm not holding your stupid against you. I will equip you. I will power you. I will, e I will embolden your life. I will make it something new. And I'm going to do that forever. Man, I want some of that forever. I'm in need of some of that forever because left to my own device, I have a tendency to keep repeating stupid things. How about you? Yeah, yeah. By doing these things, the work of Jesus, that's how we meet the needs of people who are around us. So can you advocate for those folks? Can you do for that one what you wish you could do for everyone? And can you tell them the powerful truth of Jesus? You're important. God can save you. And you can live for him. You can. And if you doubt that, look at my life. Oh, so let's talk about that just real quick then. What's your life look like today? Could you point to your life today and say, follow me as I follow Jesus? And be a good example. If you can, keep it up. If you can't, this truth teaches us that you can. You just got to say, God, forgive me. 
I need to repent. I want to be the example I'm supposed to be. Let me be that way. There's no condemnation in that, is there? There's not. So I want to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes, and we're going to have this moment of invitation. This invitation thing might be scary. It might seem odd to you. But all I'm doing is inviting you to respond to the truth that you've heard me share today. Not my words, but God's words. So today, if you realize that you've never asked Jesus to forgive you of your sins, that you're not a Jesus person and you want to be saved, then you can come forward this morning and I will tell you about salvation. If that scares you, I will be here after church. Come talk to me about salvation. You can be saved today. Maybe you need some help. Come talk to me, and maybe I've got some resources that I can help you with. Maybe you're experiencing a tough time in your life, and you just want somebody to love you and pray with you. Man, I'll do that too. You come forward, I'll pray with you. You catch me after service, I'll pray with you. Prayer changes everything. Prayer changed my life. Whatever it is that you need today, God is offering today. I invite you to take advantage of it. Dear Jesus, we do thank you for this day. God, we thank you for your truth. Let us respond to it. In Jesus' name, amen. If you'll stand to your feet. Our hymn of invitation is Living for Jesus. Sing out and respond as God directs you today. alone. Jesus people, right? Living all for Jesus all the time for what it means to follow him. And even when we misstep, when we drag behind, all we have to do is start following from where we're at and we're back where we're supposed to be. And so I want to encourage you to live for Jesus and to, uh, and to uh, respond with whose truth. Do we have anything that needs to be announced before we are dismissed? We will be having our women's Bible study tonight at 6. If you haven't been, please come. Uh, each week is just an individual lesson, so you won't have missed anything if you haven't been in the past, but it'll be tonight at 6. And we have a ministry team uh, meeting as well for, uh, for missions, if you are part of that group, and that will be tonight at 5. All right, well, let's uh, close in a word of prayer, and then we'll be dismissed. Let's